Oh, oh, she's sitting there trying to chair. Get, don't worry about me. <laughs> this ugly mug. <laughs> Get these pieces. instructive to take a little step back 
and think about the way that admissions used to be, you know, let's start with several decades ago. I know uh, those of you in admissions wouldn't believe that Mildred's been uh, in admissions that long, but uh, Mildred, perhaps you could uh, start by just talking a little bit about, um, you know, how, how you used to connect with students. And I know some of these things will seem uh, still very relevant, some will be maybe a little antiquated, but um, let's pass the mic off to Mildred and hear a little bit about that. Keep rolling with the antiquated. <laughs> <laughs> I got up for this corner. <laughs> they put me in this table because I'm old. <laughs> well, I know that's a few of you in there that have uh, been around for a while. So if you've been in um, higher education admissions or whatever for more than 20 years, raise your hands. How about more than 30 years? Raise your hands. Yep, you guys are right in there with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I expect some feedback. I'll see you back there, Carl. Um, yep, yeah, lots of things have changed. Um, I've been very fortunate um, to have been in higher education now for over 40 years. I started when I was 10. So it's like, how old is she? Still rocking the marine orange. Right? Um, and, and I think with change is exciting. But as many of you are uh, going to take you back to the 70s, it was a very different time. I know most of you were not born, so you don't have to remind me of that. But it was a, sometimes a simpler time. You know, those of you in admissions remember we had card files. We put things on index cards. You would call us, and we would go through the index and see if you apply. All paper applications. Um, none of the technology that we have, no computers. The only communication was either writing letters, yes, we did that, um, or calling, which I still do. The thing I think was was one of my most favorite stories is I worked started at Averett University, which is where I graduated from, and we got a computer. It was a Wang computer, W-A-N-G, from way back. Okay, it was a huge thing. I thought it was the coolest thing, but you couldn't do anything with it. At least I couldn't, except for playing golf. I thought that was really relevant to admission. <laughs> so we're playing golf on this. So it wasn't at all during my tenure at Avery that we had any kind of technology. So it was recruiting students, much like we do today, to go into college spheres, going out, making those connections. And that's going to be important as we kind of circle back to the collaboration and the uh, connections that we make. On the counseling side. I have folks, mentors in here that I have known for my whole life in admissions. And I think that's you know, people starting out in this profession on the admissions side is really important is developing those connections with our partners on the high school side. That was critical to me. So fast forward, you know, I moved to another university. I started, um, then I worked at Gardner Webb University, and my first technology was a CB radio. Okay, so I'm, I'm recruiting people, you know, I was talking on a CB radio. Yes, I have a handle. It was the blue apple blonde. Okay, no surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, a lot of fun things that we did. Quick, quick sidebar I actually did was talking to a trucker one time. And I didn't tell him my name, I swear I didn't. But he knew that I worked at Gardner Webb. He had a daughter, surprise, surprise, that was interested in college always recruiting. And so I said, you know, well, if you're in the area of the five, never told him my name. That's important. So one day I'm sitting in my office. Any of you remember Rick Holbrook, who was director of admissions at Gardner Webb many years ago? Okay. So I'm sitting in my office and my boss, Rick Holbrook, calls me. He says, Mildred, something very odd's happening. I said, what? He says, there's a gentleman here with his daughter looking for the blue eyed blonde. <laughs> He says, I've even been on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm telling you all that in humor to, to explain that lots of things have changed and some things have not changed. And what hasn't changed is how we feel about recruiting students and how we feel about making those connections and making sure that students are the best fit and they have a breadth of information at their disposal to make those important decisions. So I'll stop there. We're going to have some more fun stuff to talk about. Come on there. Hey, you want to talk a little bit about uh, in the last decade how things have changed? Yeah, what decades for you? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be very nice to do. 
Yeah. I think for, for me, I've been in the missions now 12 or 13 years, I think. Started my career actually as an assistant college football coach. And someone said, hey, we like how you do recruiting and the admissions director offered me a job and kind of been there ever since. But I look at back, obviously we're doing paper based and the communications. And I think now it's how much more we talk to parents. I don't know if you all feel the same way. I feel like I never talk to students. So if we get a phone call, it's a mom or dad. We get an email, it's the parent pretending to be the student. And you can tell based on how they write the email. <laughs> Or it's from us, or we applied to you. I was like, no, your student applied. You didn't do anything. You're just supporting them through that stuff. But I think the key is what we're talking about is the connections and customer service side of things of really helping students understand what they're doing and why they should be asking questions when they go visit campuses. I think now you also look at the shifting demographics in the country of students with first generation students, with immigrant students that are coming to our campuses, but those with families that only speak Spanish. So trying to also Make sure they feel comfortable on your campus. One thing we've done, we have a bilingual admissions counselor on our staff, and we've also translated some of our materials um, that are more of the process-based side. So we have a sort of a timeline that we've done in both English and Spanish to give the families so they understand what's going through the process. Another thing too, I think, is really helping people understand the financial aid side of things. And that's something I think that uh, gets more and more challenging, especially for us, we're a state university. So our budget is dictated by the state, and usually that doesn't help us very much to sit a class, but trying to get through those different areas. Um, and then lastly, when I think of the customer service side is having your campus all in on that as well. Um, for Towson, we have over 3,500 faculty and staff, but not everyone thinks the way that we do or the way you all might, where we could be recruiting someone, we were talking yesterday, for 15 months you could be talking to someone. They come to campus and have a meeting for one minute, with someone on campus and it's a horrible experience, the 15 months is gone. So it doesn't matter what you did, but how does your campus understand that everyone's recruited, like you said, always recruiting, even if you're on CB radio. But looking at what that is and making sure that people understand that. And then too, when we talk about innovation, and we were chatting about this before we talked about this, everyone always thinks technology first in innovation. But I think sometimes it's good to step back and do the handwritten notes or the phone calls or completely think of new ideas and be very versatile as you're going through a cycle. Uh, we've had to do that here, so some of my colleagues are in the room with, we saw trends happening in November and December where you gotta think of ideas quick, because if you don't, you're not gonna get a class, I probably won't have a job anymore, all those other things that kind of go through it. So looking at innovation, taking it sort of back to the personal side of things or writing a handwritten note, I think that goes a long way sometimes. Uh, one thing we did was we select our top 12 essays that were submitted. So we read every essay that comes through and each of our staff members will come to a meeting with our top two and then we vote which one we like from each of them. So it's based on recruiting territory. Um, so we had done that to, and we write a handwritten note back to that student. We sent them some TU swag and all this other stuff that they really enjoyed. But it was just, just personalizing that experience. And I think it doesn't matter how big your university or small it is, you can personalize this experience regardless if you have 13,000 applicants, 27 plus thousand, or you guys have applies. Oh, about six. So you look at all these different numbers, you can personalize that because you have a big enough staff to be able to do it. Um, and I think that's really the key is helping students look at this process the way they should and help them understand what they should actually be asking when they're on a college campus. Um, not so much, I think sometimes people think we're all the salespeople and you need to go to Towson or Mary Washington or VTech, <laughs> but we want the students to pick the best place for them because it's going to be a great experience and they'll be a great alumni because they had a great experience at that particular place. So I think it's really helping them make that decision. And I tell people all the time at Open House, I'm like, if you don't love everything about this place, do not come to Towson University. And some of those parents are looking at me like I'm crazy, but I want them to actually know what they're going through. Actually, any additional insights in terms of, uh, you've been at Longwood and now University of Mary Washington in terms of things that you did even just a handful of years ago that, that now maybe you, know, you do something totally different or you scrap that idea and try to um, So yes, I have been in admissions for, well, I'm wrapping up my ninth year. Um, yes, I worked at Longwood for about eight and I just transitioned to Mary Washington a year ago, a little less than a year ago. Um, I think just to echo everything that has been said, one of, one of the big things is working with parents, as David said, um, that is something I think that has become more you 
we've been doing more and more lately um, to the point where sometimes it's we when we're making calls we wish oh can i just get the parent on the phone because more than likely i'll have a conversation with them they'll tell me where their student is in the process versus when i get the student on the phone it's a kind of a wishy-washy or no i don't have any questions or i really don't want to talk to you right now um so i think in our process a lot of times we're, we're wishing to connect with parents a little bit more um this year we started a parent Facebook group. Um, so we kind of, we tried out with our um, parents at our first admitted student open house and asked them just to get an idea, a like, sense, would they be receptive to this? And by far overwhelming response at the first admitted student open house, um, that a parent uh, Facebook group would be key to them, that this is something they really wanted to see happen in our admissions process. So we started, they have been very active. Parents are posting pictures of their kids. I don't know if the kids know that these pictures are being posted of them. Um, they're like, look at my daughter, look at my son. Um, so in, in our process is tailoring a lot of our communications to the parents. And in our communication plan, um, some of our messages are specific to them. Um, some of the things that you know, may kind of seem antiquated, and this is something I struggle with our counselors of saying, yes, this, these are things we should still do that maybe you thought um, the, these are these are tactics of, you know, 15 years ago. The handwritten notes and the phone calls, um, just like David and Mildred said, those are things that you should continue to do. So while, yes, we're incorporating all this technology and trying to be innovative in the way that we're communicating with students, sometimes those, those types of touches um, that some of our younger professionals and, and my my staff a lot of them are like under 30s why do i have to still write handwritten notes like this is ridiculous or making these calls um but overwhelming response after we end our cycle every year when we ask for feedback from parents and from students about why mary Walsh, what set us apart what distinguished us is that we still make those personal connections with them that it wasn't just the constant emails that were sent out through a crm that are very cold and students and parents know it was the, the phone calls at seven o'clock at night um, the handwritten notes of thank you for visiting our campus that kind of distinguished us and i know every every institution you know you're some of you are very large and you can't have those kind of touches all of the time at smaller schools it becomes a little bit easier because of the pool that we manage um, um, but just kind of keep that in mind that yes we're looking forward but some of those things that have you know been done for for many many years still continue to work i know uh facebook officially became uncool about a year and a half ago i know that because my parents joined that very <laughs> you know kids now uh, that was like the official you know, jump the shark know. moment uh, but uh you know now, um, you know college. So really, undeniably, there is there is change in the admissions world. So now, kind of to, to the second part of what we're discussing is how do colleges adapt to those sort of changes? Um, students connect in different ways. They communicate in different ways. Um, so let's start back with you, Ashley. And you know, really, what has Mary Washington done um, to try and meet Gen Z students where they are? Um, yes, yeah, so to meet our, our Generation Z kids, um, one, we are starting with texting. So we do text students um, important information. We try not to overuse it. Um, we don't want to flood students with emails and phone calls and text messages. Uh, so we do it at very target points throughout the year, just giving them you know quick information like, oh, application date's coming up. Uh, we do ask students if, if texting is something that they want to do. Sometimes that's, that can be a little bit too personal of you sending messages directly to their phone. Um, so we did ask the students in our applicant pool if this is an you know, okay method of communication with them. Um, part of the reason we're here today is Zimi. So we incorporated Zimi into our um, communication and strategy or strategic plan for the year. Um, we use Zimi at the beginning stages of the, the cycle um, to assess um, and kind of get to know our applicants a little bit better. So we of course, we need all the essays and the personal statements that students write. We also have an interview process uh, where students can opt into an interview. It's not a man or a required part of the admissions process. And then we use Zimi. So we allow students to either do an interview or Zimi, or they could do both. Um, with the Zimi profiles, that really gave us a little bit more insight into who our applicants 
applicants are, especially those that actually took full advantage of building the profile. Um, and we didn't use that as, as a way to, to make a decision in a sense, just to, again, to get to know our students a little bit better, like with the essay. Um, and then when we moved into the spring semester, we built a senior community. Um, so for all of our admitted students, they joined this community um, and we hope you know, to get them to start engaging with each other and really decide that, okay, Mary Washington is the place for me. Um, we do have some students that have decided, okay, I'm not going and that's valuable information. We, we know, okay, we're gonna stop communicating with you if you say you're not coming to the institution. Um, for, for those that are going to Mary Washington, they're, they're building connections already and that's helping us, particularly helping us hopefully with MELT um, so that we don't see a lot of students dropping out um, from this point until you know, the start of classes. Dave, any insights? Uh, the one thing I want to add is well, we use ZME for our admissions committee that we have. So depending if students decided to send that in, it's kind of those borderline gray area students. So we've utilized it there. One thing I want to say, just another way we've uh, connected with students is at our open houses about two years ago, our staff came up with the idea to look and see who signed up for open house whose application at that point in time is completely ready for review. And then we actually admitted students at open house. So we would basically match up who was there. And then I would say, we have some special guests here today. If I call your name, will you stand up? So we would call all these names of students and they all stand up and they're kind of like, why am I standing up right now? And we had their admissions packet for them at open house. So that was something just a way to do something that surprised. We did it at all five of our open houses. I think the one, there was like 40 people at one of the open houses that got admitted. So it's something that's been growing for us, but just another way to connect with them. And we were talking a little bit yesterday too, where you had all the moms are typically crying and the dads there taking the photos of the students and going through it. But it was a really cool experience. One of the students that actually we admitted was there with her best friend from another high school from New York. And it was also her birthday that day. So she got admitted on her birthday with us. So it was pretty cool, just a, a different way to kind of connect with folks as well. So you always steal that idea, it's okay. Yeah. We might not have over, overlapping applications, so we'll be all right. Well, and I think when we're talking about how we can adapt to change, I think it was really important for us to really sit back and think about as an institution what's working. And if we talk about a holistic review, what are those elements of that review that help us make those important decisions? And then as you think outside the box, when we talked about adding ZV, we thought it was just kind of a natural progression for us. It was one more piece of information that could be essentially a tipping point. We had 70, over 1,700 students do ZV profiles for Virginia Tech this year. And let me explain a little bit. It was very easy for them to um, incorporate this information. We have a link on our application. Uh, on, on the application and which then run into college net for us. And so when we're sitting in committee and looking at all those things, not just those quantitative things, not just your scores and your grades and your courses, but all the other things that we consider in a holistic review, uh, it was easy for us to click on these. It, it showed an authentic self is what I would say. These are not professionally done. We hope they would never be. It gives us a chance to see a different side of a student. Um, we've had students, one in particular, that was interested in architecture. And so when we looked, I don't know which time she went all kinds of cool stuff. But when we were looking at this young person, he was telling us how he built a tiny house. And so naturally, that intrigued me. It wasn't very long. He started off with kind of his drawings, and he moved into how he built the tiny house. Well, needless to say, that's what really helped him in terms of architecture. But we had students do all kinds of things, sometimes in little videos, sometimes still pictures. But again, it's just another piece of information that is created by the student that really sort of, some of them are pretty heartwarming, to be honest with you. But helps us to make those decisions using lots of information. So that's one thing that we do. We thought was very, very successful and quite easy. What I have for students to do. The other thing I think is important. So let me ask you of those that raised your hand when I said if you've been in the profession for over twenty years. Raise your hands again. Okay. Now you can put them down. I don't want to you. Okay. How many of you have a Twitter account? Yay! I'm excited. I bet all of you have Facebook, right, Parker? <laughs> yes, we all have Facebook. I love, many, I love Facebook. I know. How many of you have Instagram? 
Snapchat. Okay, how many of you have a bit moti? I do, I do. I do. I'm so excited. I used to do I'm going to have a, I do Twitter. I tweet. At Mildred BT, I have 387 followers. By the end of this conference, I have to be over 400. <laughs> this session, it better be over. This session, that I'll put you up. But I think as you're talking to students, so say you were all 17 year olds. For us as admissions professionals, to talk about how we interact. Can you imagine some of my age telling 17-year-olds that, you know, I have a Twitter account, I know how to take those screenshots, so if they say something inappropriate, I can call the college counselor and tell them they shouldn't be doing what they just did. And they're like, whoa, she knows about that. And then when I talk about Instagram, so you have to be in their world. I'm not saying you necessarily have to do all these things, but you need to be aware of how they interact, okay? Um, so we did talk about, at the end of the process, when they post on Facebook, on Twitter, the appropriateness of some of the things they tweet or post, right? Because some things should not be. They don't know how to take disappointment, and so they're saying terrible things, not everybody, but when you can take a snapshot and get back to the parents or counselors about that, we want it to be a teachable moment. So these are things I think in their world, if we use Zimi community now, which is nice because the students connect with one another, they're finding roommates. And again, it gets back to what we just said at the beginning, having students that are very happy with the choices they're making and one more step that you can do to connect those young people for best fit, okay? So whether it, if you're using Zimi or, in, or some other means of connecting connectivity with those students, I think it's important to step back from what you have done or maybe haven't done and see what you can do. It's okay to try these things. Um, it's like Ashley said, sometimes students want us to text message them, sometimes they don't. There's just so many different platforms I think we could use to reach out and be innovative as, as we're kind of moving forward. And uh, I was talking to Mildred yesterday and she had a very salient insight about how really people on missions, they care deeply about student stories. And, and one of the nice things that Mildred said about Zini was that it, in her words, gives us a window into their world. Um, so I thought I'd just play a sample uh, meet me video of a student here. So here's a student, Trevor, he's from Virginia. Um, you know, he's got different activities, he's got um, you know, he's in the Boy Scouts, but he made this meet me video for Virginia Tech, which is very powerful. Yeah, just give us a second. Thank you. And we have his permission, by the way. Hi, my name is Drew. I am in my neighborhood. Oh, he does. So, have you seen this? Oh, you have. Michael Jordan back there, uh, yeah. the original MJ. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Hi there. My name is Trevor Master, and I'm a senior at Freedom High School. And I'm applying to Virginia Tech College of Engineering in the fall of 2017. I'm going to use this video to describe myself in under two minutes. So, one of my passions is wrestling. And I hope you don't mind. I'm going to drill with my dad a little bit while I tell, while I tell you a little bit about my wrestling career. So. I've uh, been wrestling for about <laughs> since seventh grade, and uh, I've been a two-year captain, and I've been in the state tournament twice. Uh, and last year, I got uh, fifth in the state. Uh, <laughs> all right. And as you can see, I'm also a boy scout. I have earned the highest rank in scouting, which is evil. I have over 50 merit badges, 50 hiking miles and 150 community service hours. This is earned me the highest rank, which is equal. My next passion is lacrosse. Got a little nervous here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is I've been playing in goalie since I was in third grade, and I've been playing on my high school varsity team the past two years. I also love math and physics. I can calculate the amount of work that I do on each clear after a save. Doing half the math, times the 
final velocity squared times half the mass times the initial velocity squared. Which on average is negative 12.4 joules. Yeah. But I love all sports. I'm especially a football fan. I love the Steelers. I love watching a Tinder Brown score touchdown on Sunday afternoons. And I love watching the Steelers win so that they can make it to the Super Bowl. Like they've won six times. <laughs> I'm also a computer. I also love computers and science. I've been in the programming club for the past two years and I'm in AP computer science this year. I wrote this Java code that executes a game for this robot. But I also love to work out. Did I fail to mention that I do all of this as an amputee? But that doesn't define who I am or what I can accomplish. I hope to bring all these injuries to Blacksburg next fall as a host. Thanks for watching and go I'm not watched that without crying. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus, it's hard to, hard to do anything to, to try and uh, match that or top that. But uh, really, very powerful student story. Uh, and uh, it's, it's great that we have someone even from, from that area. Uh, but, um, Miltry, you talked earlier um, when we had spoken about admission offices, in your words, trying new things and getting out of their comfort zone. Um, so curious, kind of what you mean by that, and um, what that what that has meant specifically for Virginia Tech and some of the things that you've done. Well, now I can't lie. I've been at Virginia Tech now for 21 years, and you know, when you think of Virginia Tech, you might think of innovation and technology. And certainly, you know, we have a president and provost that are trying to think outside the box of new and innovative ways in terms of attracting students, programs for young people to make them successful as we move forward um, over the next 10 or 15 years. And with all that said though, I feel like um, we're somewhat taking a back seat in admissions. We still are, don't read online, which I know surprises many of my colleagues. So I still have a file with Audrey Hill's name on it that I am <laughs> reviewing. So we are moving toward paperless environment. So I tell you all that to say, we have not been innovative in my opinion. Our innovation is maybe sending a few more emails or doing um, you know, a few more things uh, on the web. So when we talk about adding CME or doing more social media, that's really stepping out of the box for us, which by the way, has been very successful. So I, we will continue to do more of that, but you've got to have folks in your respective areas that are competent. You just don't say, I'm going to start doing things on social media and not have someone that understands the nuances of this, right? Because that can be a disaster. So one of the things is you're thinking about ways to connect with students. Make sure that you've got staff that are vested and interested, or that you've got, whether it's even you've got a company that's going to help you through the, the growing pains of adding something to your application or joining a community so that you can use whatever means possible to um, be effective. And it's going to be different. You know, what's effective for Virginia Tech might not be the top center of and, and so forth. So I think for us, we want to be more cutting edge, and I think we are moving in that direction. But for my school, I think it was a little slower than I would have liked to have seen. Um, but hopefully over the next couple of years, you'll see us doing bigger and better things. Dave, uh, when we had spoke, uh, you know, when we think about innovation, oftentimes a lot of people think about technology, 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 we're a tech company, so uh, I'm inclined to think that way. But really, there are both kind of low-tech approaches and high-tech approaches, and you've incorporated both at Towson. So, um, any insights that you can share for folks in the audience as to both of those pieces? Yeah, at Towson, we are paperless online. So basically, there's a virtual, we call it image analysis system that we have. So everything's there instead of having this, it's online. So that was kind of weird for people when it first switched over. Like, wait, where's this going to be? There's no longer 50 plus filing cabinets in the hallway where 
everything is in alphabetical order and going through those those things. So it's been a change. When I came to TU's right when they switched over, other uh, schools they worked with were the same was with having the paper files. But then I think you go back to just looking at how are you helping that experience for the students. So is it you're online, but is it user friendly? I think that's always another thing that we look at as well. Is yeah, it's great having the technology, but if it's not user friendly, if it's not intuitive, and those sort of things, that's when you end up getting phone calls. And then when you use an outside vendor, and you pay hundreds of dollars to call them and tell them to fix stuff. So that's always been been interesting to do that. And another thing I think too with with our staff and something I've tried to do is also explain to our team why we're doing something. Because a lot of times our bosses will give us, you need to go hit this number, do this certain thing, and then I'll walk into my staff and I'm like, okay, we have to do this. But having them understand why we're doing it, because I think they're more bought into what's actually going on. Sometimes I don't always do that communication-wise, and I have some of my staff are here too. I do my best to communicate with them all the time and tell them what those things are and why we're doing them. Because I think once they have an understanding, then they're more invested in actually doing it and understanding what we're doing, or also any ideas they have. And that's what I think is really key too. With hopefully with all of you in your positions, you're able to have ideas regardless of title. Because I think sometimes people are like, "Well, you're only this position; you can't talk to this person, or you need to set up a meeting with me." Um, I think at times I'm at fault for having way too wide open of a door, <laughs> which doesn't always help, but. But I think it is, it's key for the kind of staff to be really bought into those things and what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and we know sometimes admissions isn't fair when it's usually it's basically three years or 30 years. So, and understanding what that is and what they can really do. But we've used everything from a low tech to high tech, and each year we've added more and more things that we're doing. So, whether they're, I know you were talking about receptions earlier. So, I mean, receptions in different places for students, doing different things on campus. We've had, um, a big admitted student day that we have on campus, we would invite all of our out-of-state families in the night before and do sort of a private reception with them as well. So it's just other ways to really connect with people that are coming to your campus. Great. And Ashley, what about you? What's your mindset and strategy in terms of trying to innovate and doing new things? Um, so some of the things that David mentioned, um, I think we try to practice at Mary Washington too. I think trying to explain to counselors why things are important for them is, is a tactic that um, our director, Melissa, and I um, try to implement with the counselors that not just doing something, but explaining kind of the why behind and why it's important. Um, we also are a paperless office, um, and, and that was a big transition for me from moving from Longwood, where we still read files. We had, you know, the, the 50 files we carry home each night and read, um, so then reading online, but it, it helps us, I think, become a little bit more efficient in our process. Um, we're the Eagles, that's our mascot, um, and we have well, what we call an Eagle Bound portal. So being paperless allows us to connect um, students to their records so they can log into the Eagle Bound portal, see where they are in the process, see if they're missing anything, so they can quickly follow up with us and say, oh, I I'm missing this document, or I'm missing my test scores, I'm sending that information to you um, and then we also connect our counselors so we work by territories um, and on their Eagle Bound portal they can see who their counselor is so if they have a quick question they can directly email me and say hey I'm, I'm checking on the status of my application I see you're missing this or I have a question about this academic program um, so being accessible to students in this process I think is really important and another way we try to distinguish ourselves Terrific. Um, I'm just curious, um, in terms of the audience here, um, who's on the college side? Okay, great. Uh, high school side? And then, uh, beautiful. And then independence? Terrific. Um, on the college side, curious here, you know, we talked about some of the advantages and disadvantages of texting students. Um, who on the college side uh, text students? Decent amount here. Um, anyone else? Uh, we talked earlier about um, you know, whether it's Twitter or Instagram. Um, curious, anyone use Snapchat within their uh, admissions department? Got some hands there. Um, well, uh, there are a lot of interesting things. And um, you know, I had a suggestion from uh, folks on the panel. Um, uh, you know, these, are, these are certainly leaders in higher ed, but 
I think they'd be the first to tell you that they don't have all of the great ideas in terms of innovation. So, um, you know, I'll walk around a little bit here, but curious if anyone else is doing something that they think is innovative that um, would be beneficial for, for everyone to um, really learn and understand. Um, so, okay. I don't have yeah, any, Rob. I have a question. Not oh, a question. Okay, sure. Um, I'm just curious to know. I think Mildred just said seventeen thousand. Oh. How many did you look at? We looked at all of them. Okay. I didn't just, personally. Okay. So okay. I'm just curious to know a couple things. Just okay. To, to, to kind of look at the question. Yeah. Is that is there time to review them? Mm -hmm. um, there's also the reality of cake can impress the heck out of you, mm -hmm. but what's missing in the packet is probably legit. It could be legit in terms of work ethic or something else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, does the ZME with you know an extra shout out from accounts or supporting whatever? Um, also, what's bad in the ZME? Can it hurt a kid? You know, that's a great question. Did y'all could y'all hear everything that Robin shared? It's really just taken that for us the ZME profile and taking a step further. So yes, we do have time to read. Um, we all read by region, so I'm reading a lot of the Richmond students, um, but we do take that time. They're short for the most part, so they're not anything of great length. To be honest with you, if I don't recall them ever hurting. There's a couple that probably would, I mean, the kids doing some stupid things, in my opinion, <laughs> but we didn't let that, I mean, they do that anyway. So I didn't, we didn't let that hurt them. It was more for us, sort of a tipping point, like in a holistic review sort of should be. If there is uh, recommendations from a counselor supported by maybe something that the student wrote or um, depicted in this video, maybe it was activities connecting them back to majors. So for me, it was just another piece of a wealth of information that we should take the time. That's the most important thing we do in, in making these important decisions. So for to your second point, I don't think in any case that it really did it hurt them. In some cases where the students just didn't have the academic, was it something that would push them so far? No, it didn't. I would say just like anything else for us, it was more of a tipping point. Do you all watch them all? So the ones we just started for the first year with them, so we didn't have a ton that came through, but the ones that were utilized were the gray area borderline students. So we bring them into our committee and then go around the room and everyone votes. And if it's nine, eight, either way, that's what we do in regards to the votes. I think another thing that actually hurts students more is essays. So we have, so in my career, there's been at least three times where we have solely denied a student because of their essay. There was one student that basically was a, would have been a danger to our campus based on what they wrote. And another student was just very vulgar and inappropriate. And these were students that were three, eight GPAs and really high SAT scores and we denied them purely because of their essay. So, and the student didn't call us. So they knew why the thing had happened. But what does he need to do watch when we read all these things too? And same, uh, we had a couple hundred students complete ZME profiles. Um, each of the counselors, as they were reading by region, they were expected to review the ZME profiles, which we had the time to do, um, to include a link in the profile. So Melissa and I, our director, um, we go through and kind of finish up, making sure decisions look appropriate. Um, and we would look at the ZME profiles um, in second read. Um, to just get some more insight about the applicants and the, how the class is shaping up. Um, as Mildred and David said, it was never used to, because we didn't have anything um, that was glaring in any of the ZB profiles. So I think if someone put something bad in their ZB profile, then yes, that would have been an applicant who would have been denied. But none of the ZB profiles that we had, we have anything um, that made us want to deny a student. It was, again, additional piece of information to hopefully help us offer admission. And maybe you said this, but how do you, Send it to, if you just create one, is it automatically accessible by anyone who has a ZME account? Or do you have to tell that institution that you, how, how does a kid communicate that they have a ZME account to each right. of you? Right, so they create their, so the question that Robin had, how do students um, indicate to us that they have a ZME account that we should then go out and view? Um, so students create their ZME account and then they're given a link. Um, it's in like the top right hand corner of their profile. They're supposed to copy and paste that into comments. So we're a common app participant. We oh, okay. Around. We have a link on our application. Oh, yeah. yeah, and there's a for common app, there's a link for them to. So they could in theory do one, but not send it to every school they apply to. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. literally will click the button and it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. While we're on this topic, I'm wondering if any of you did any statistics about were you more, did you have a higher acceptance rate for students who submitted Zoom? We won't know that. Either. Yeah, so we haven't dug that. So the question was, um, have we had a higher acceptance rate for students who completed Zinis? We haven't dug that deep in into our data to see if we've accepted more students um, based on the Zini profile. Again, it wasn't wasn't necessarily a factor to in, in that sense. It was it's one more piece of information, very similar to an interview or an essay. Um, so I I don't expect that we'll see a higher percentage of acceptances just based on the ZME profile, um, but that'll be something that at the end of the year, Melissa and I look at. Will you be doing those kinds of statistics? Yeah. I think with us, it's always trying to figure out why students did choose or didn't choose you. Yeah. I know we'll always do a big data dive in the summer and look at different cells of students and all these different factors. Because when you look at it, pretty much 80% of the decision-making process, we don't control for a student. So, and that's funny when y'all look at everyone that's in the college world, our livelihood is based on the decision making of a 17 year old. So it's really not good job security in any way, shape, or form. So but understanding and then trying to go back and like, why did this happen this year? And then is it a trend we're seeing for next year? Because that's always what's really difficult projecting yield. You never know when that's actually gonna end up. Yeah. So kids could theoretically have six or seven babies to go to different schools. Because I was just suddenly thinking, you know, the computer sends the, the essay to you and forgets to change mm -hmm. Virginia Tech and, and leaves mm -hmm. Nelson on there, et cetera. So I, I just was curious how many, they can have multiple. They could have a yeah. They could, and some that we've seen aren't specific, like Trevor's that okay. talks about Virginia Tech. It could just be more general. Like I had a student that sent something about her interest in synchronized swimming, which I thought was really cool. So they can do different things. It may not be specific. His was because this is where you wanted to be. Yeah, I'll, I'll play one for example for a student that didn't mention anything right. about what school he wants to attend, just so you get a little flavor. <laughs> I am the product of my stars. They're not the victim of my pain, and I sway to the weight of the ancestors swimming inside my bloodstream, hoping that I will stumble and drown. I am an athlete. I run with the chains society has provided in hopes to lessen another's burden. I run with a raw vindication and hopes to leave a footstep that lasts long after my lungs stop life. I am a poet. I'm the product of a broken child and a blank notebook. I'm the product of the thought that the only thing stronger than actions are the words that back them up. I am black and I am proud of the midnight resting in my skin. I am a son and a brother and I love my family dearly. I am alive. And I relish in every rise and release of my breath. I am alive and free to dance and sing and laugh and cry. Now keep living until either my pin runs out of ink or the world quivers under every syllable I have laid down. I am me. And that's simply love. I play that for a lot of colleges, and lot. Often, often they'll say, I want that kid. <laughs> In terms of like who owns the content. So the students own all the content. So you that they can't do own. anything with this ever? So no, I mean, we, we wouldn't. We, we can't sell it or uh, really all we and we make very clear in our terms of use that the student really owns the content we want them to be the masters of their own page really what we'll see is students throughout the student life cycle um, will continue to update their page we don't want this to be just a one and done you know we want students to use this for internships uh, ultimately for jobs for scholarships so you know here's a student Jonathan Hill from Morehouse who uh, and a student's story is going to evolve, right? You know, it's not, the story isn't totally written when they're 17 years old and applying to Mary Washington or Towson or Virginia Tech. It's going to evolve. They're going to do new and exciting things. So, um, and, and sometimes they'll do a uh, chronology of pictures from, you know, youth to where they are now and kind of things that they have developed. And it's really cool, particularly if they're looking at engineering and some of the things, some technology, things that they may even have created to be able to sit back and look. I think the other thing, I know many of us, um, you know, we're still doing things like email. And, and that's, even though 
you know, it, the, doc, uh, the data has shown that students don't tend to use email as much. When they get to our institutions, they clearly will use email. And so we tell them in our sessions to make sure no matter what mode of deliveries uh, colleges and universities choose to use, you need to check these things, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or email, because that's the way we're communicating to make sure that things are complete, because if they're not, then they have no chance to, to, for us to make those, those decisions. And it's often until you cancel them that they really start really looking, as you know. Yes. yes. Um, I'm wondering, I can certainly see that it's easier to use email than it is email. Like, Wondering if it's supposed to have a separate account for different colleges as well, slide out, um, creating an opportunity where students can have a basic profile, but maybe separate videos for the schools that they're applying to set that they don't have to That's in the product roadmap. Oh, okay. So yeah. Okay. Great. Then that that will be uh, really probably next cycle we'll, we'll unveil that. But yeah, that's great feedback that we can give that um, sometimes a student might want to personalize it a little bit to each school. Well, with the volume of, you know, why Virginia Tech, why Wake Forest, that ask you questions and you can see the course in the institution, if the video content is addressed to that in a nuanced and nicer way, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, very powerful. It's much more fun, too. Mm -hmm. How do you make money? For us? So, yeah, good question. <laughs> so, you know, we have a free module um, where, you know, schools like, of these three great schools will use us in the review and selection of students. And then we have this community piece as well. So um, Ashley was talking a little bit about this, but really we'll have premium services where um, colleges will build these communities um, and we'll give colleges analytics in terms of who's interacting, who's not interacting. Um, they're able to send campaigns to students on their smartphones. Um, so they can text students, they can send push notifications. So, um, especially on the yield side of things, and in terms of really enabling a college to bring their campus culture to life through a very dynamic mobile experience, we charge colleges for that piece. But for colleges that just want to use us in the review and selection of students, that piece of ZD will always be free. And I think, you know, oftentimes, you know, I'll hear from leaders in admissions that we really want to see student stories and. Initially, when we started, we were thinking that, you know, we'll eventually charge colleges for that piece, but really colleges that like to see student stories, um, that like to humanize this process, um, we thought it was inappropriate to charge colleges for that piece. So um, the review and selection of students for on Z will always be free. And let me tell you something about this community, which is good. The analytics that we can derive, and again, this is our first year, because students are talking to each other and you can get a, you can glean information on how many are thinking about accepting their offer or maybe have made other choices. Sometimes they haven't even told you, right? How many counselors in the room are still wondering about you, right? Okay, so we might know some of that if it's the last minute to help us when we're trying to project where our numbers might lie. I know it's no exact science, but these are some pretty cool things that we can get as they're talking amongst themselves. And again, remember, it's all about that student satisfaction. This is, we use it more towards the end. So we're talking about the yield, much more so than in the, the recruitment piece of it. <coughs> Other questions? Jennifer? In, in the um, context of the Virginia Tech Center, um, what uh, generally speaking, we just have a general landing page. Uh, so we're now working with a few hundred colleges. Uh, uh, about 70 or so are using this community piece. Um, and uh, the rest will uh, use us in the review and more general review and selection of students. Any other questions here um, from folks in the audience? Yeah, maybe especially on the high school side, independent side. Um, yes. Being that I don't see another hand, I wanted to ask something. Ashley, you talked about how you tailor some of your information for parents. And I just wanted to ask the other three schools because at least in where I work, 
we really try to have the students own this process <laughs> and have them take charge of it and do it. And then I'm wondering, some of the things maybe that they come back and said, should I maybe have been a little more lenient or kind in my response? Because it really wasn't coming from them. Yeah, don't be lenient. <laughs> okay, I, I wasn't. I'm just wondering if I need to repent. <laughs> no, don't repent. Um, okay, so yes, we do tailor some of our messages to the parents because we know, we can actually drill down in our, we use Hobson's um, as our CRM, um, and the connect portion of Hobson's. So we can drill down to see if a student has viewed a message, when they viewed that message, if they interacted with the message. So it can be almost like big brother looking on them. And, and you've had students, oh, well, I didn't get that. I'm like, oh, actually, I looked back in your record. I saw that you got this message. You looked at it at this day. And this is how you interacted with the message. You clicked in the link. So it can get, we can drill it down to that level. Uh, but we realize that a lot of our students are not looking in, in the initial stages because they are bombarded by so many colleges and they are so overwhelmed in their senior year, they're not looking at our messages. And I mean, I think this is across colleges, it's just not unique to us. So we realize that we have to communicate some, we have to communicate important messages to parents as well. So the students are still getting those same messages, but we also have a message for the parents that's similar. Um, like application dates or the first year students uh, questionnaire on um, what you've deposited, that's about to launch. Um, so important things that we know students need to act on pretty quickly. Um, if we're a little bit hesitant that they may not see that message or they miss it because they just received 50 on the same day from all the other colleges, um, then we're also, sent, we're also communicating with parents. And it's something we, you know, ethically or I don't know if ethical is the right word, but something that we toy with emotionally because we want students to own this process. And that's something all of us talk about in our presentations and on our panels and workshops that this is the student's time. This really isn't, you know, the parents or the guardians, this process. Um, but we understand that some students are just going to ignore <laughs> us until they, they're deciding, until they're deciding, okay, this is the school I want to go to. And then they start communicating. And I understand perfectly because as far as scholarship listings, started putting them online so parents could see them so they could harass their kids <laughs> and make their kids come to us. So I understand that you want to involve parents, but that, that's a battle that we really, really fight. But we really feel that in a school, you want to teach them to fish. They may need to transfer or do whatever. So you want them to know those things. So that's why I wanted to ask. I think we have to have a whole other session on parents, right? <laughs> no. So I think the important thing with parents, sometimes they think because of all this technology, we're connected with the students. And all of a sudden, the parents that we all never write to us. And we write to them every month. But it's because it's not something tangible that they see. You can't forget about the parents in the equation. And how can you bring them into the fold? But yet, as you suggested, make sure that the students are driving the truck. Great. And just wrapping up, really appreciate everyone being here today. Um, and really, there's no doubt that the world of education and counseling specifically uh, really faces enormous challenges. I was in Michigan just a couple weeks ago um, visiting some of our partner schools in Detroit. If you look at Detroit, a city with a 47% illiteracy rate. Um, let's get, talk about counseling in, specific, in particular. Um, that that commission to study. Um, does anyone know here what the average um, number of high school students per counselor is across the country? Yeah, it's 478 to one. Um, in California, where we're based, you think, oh, California's really progressive. No, we're actually the worst in the country. It's 912 to one. Um, and really, I think most disturbing to me, 89% of low-income first-gen students don't graduate college within six years. Um, so there's no doubt that really this entire field faces enormous challenges. What you do is not easy. It's not a cakewalk. You know, if you want an easy job, work for Zini. Um, <laughs> just go to these and party. Um, so there are enormous, enormous problems, no doubt, but Exciting thing to me is we can all be part of the problem or we can all be part of the solution. Really what you do day in, day out, 
Um, in Ashley's case, you know, she's emailing me at like 1.37 in the morning. You know, it's weekend in, weekend out, night in, night out. Um, you know, I really appreciate all the efforts you do to help students, um, to counsel them, to put them on the right paths. Um, so please give yourselves a round of applause as we close Oh, and one final note. Uh, we are going to do a drawing here. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do it now. Does any, did anyone not put their business card in? Um, here? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so this is a twenty-five dollar gift card. That's gonna to go to Elizabeth Fitzgerald from Stevenson. Congratulations. Uh next is fifty dollars. Shuffle these up a little more. She can't see anything. <laughs> $50 is for Karina Reed from the University of Maryland. <laughs> now $100. And again, I was not in charge of this, otherwise it would have been $5. <laughs> the winner here. <laughs> we have Kenneth Roach from Coastal Carolina. Oh. Well, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Great job.